What's up, everyone? Christopher Walker back here again with the Marshall. How's it going? I'm doing good, you know. Just uh, drinking my coffee, starting to wake up a little bit. Heck yeah. Yep. So, what are we talking about today? Uh, we're going to talk about macronutrients. Okay, sweet. And what's thermo and what ain't thermo? What ain't thermo? Yeah. I like it. So, uh, the three macronutrients, do we just want to break it up and talk about each one and kind of segment it that way? Yeah. Uh, what do you want to start with? Mm, <clears throat> let's go with protein. All right. Protein. So, um, whenever it comes to protein, um, the amino acid profile is what matters most, is it not? Uh, well, there's just, yeah, there's probably two elements to this. Mm -hmm. Amino acid profile and then also the just raw volume of protein that's consumed. Hmm. It's probably another thing we should touch on. But yeah, amino acid profiles are extremely important in terms of just like the makeup of the type of protein that you're choosing. And then there's better ones and worse ones. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, things like... And, uh, and probably ride-alongs. Oh, yeah. Like if you look at, you know, uh, soy protein versus... Uh, grass-fed beef, yeah. you know. Or, or potato protein. Or That's potato a pretty good one, too. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, interrupt. Oh, no. So, like, for instance, the difference between um, poultry, so things that are high in tryptophan, um, versus red meat that is high in the more pro-metabolic amino acids or bone broth, collagen, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, So there's really a spectrum of, like, preferable proteins versus non-preferable ones. And it, I think it is a spectrum because, you know, we're not going to be like, don't eat chicken. But if you eat only chicken, you're getting a, a skewed amount of those uh, amino acids that aren't preferable, like tryptophan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, why is tryptophan specifically an amino acid that we want to avoid uh, on a consistent basis? Uh, basically, it'll increase the production of serotonin. And contrary to popular belief, people have already too high of serotonin. Uh, it's, it's something that's not, it's an anti-metabolic neurotransmitter. Um, not necessarily protective at all. Uh, also, it's highly correlated with excess estrogen production in mm -hmm. the body. Uh, so, and, and like we mentioned in another episode uh, with, you know, gut dysfunction. So... You definitely don't want to overconsume any sort of amino acids that are going to upregulate the production of serotonin. Uh, people already, people should be, in my opinion, and this has been my opinion for 10 years now, is, is like you should be focusing way more on dopamine, uh, like pr producing your own natural dopamine, more of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the another interesting thing is, is uh, you know, with. Well, I, I won't move on from this topic. But do you have anything else? Yeah. Um, I would say the main thing that I see with serotonin is that it's high in a hibernative state. So whenever animals typically go into hibernation, their serotonin levels are going to raise. So they get sleepy. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is so the metabolic rate goes down so they're not burning through all of their energy stores throughout the months that they're in hibernation. Because if their metabolic rate stays high, then they're gonna burn off all of the energy that they have stored for that hibernation period and starve to death. Mm -hmm. So, and then if they do wake up during that hibernative state, they don't have any food available because it's cold outside. Yeah, and humans don't hibernate, so we don't need to worry about that. Exactly, yeah. But um, no, other than that, uh, what are the more favorable proteins? Mm, basically small fish or shellfish and uh, um, ruminant proteins so animals like cows or livestock of whatever kind that mm. you know walk around eat grass have too many stomachs and yeah that sort of thing um, really the the amino acid profile of those are definitely preferable as long as you the caveat is not to have any of that ride along like I was saying like uh, you know conventionally farmed animals are typically going to have a ton of uh, excess estrogen and a lot of antibiotics in the, in the tissue. Uh, you don't want that. You want an animal that was raised ethically and 
in its natural form, not with without a ton of excess stress. And uh, that that protein is definitely gonna be great, especially like if you look at um, collagen and bone broth and that that type of thing. If you look at like a supplemental form of the, of the protein from those animals, uh, that's not muscle tissue, but it's more like uh, whether it's gelatin or like connective tissue. Those are awesome because they're extremely high in, in uh, the amino acids that people don't tend to get enough of, hmm. and uh, especially like glycine and proline. And the interesting thing is like a lot of people condemn collagen protein and gelatin because they say that it is not a complete protein. The complete protein idea is, I think, kind of ridiculous. Uh, it's, it, they, they use that to sell whey protein. And it's funny because if you look at an amino acid profile of, of collagen, the, uh, the um, amino acids that are omitted from collagen that aren't in it are the ones you don't want to be eating, like mm -hmm. tryptophan mm -hmm. uh, and methionine. And cysteine. Yeah, cysteine. They're the ones that are, that are stress amino acids, like stress-based amino acids. And um, so it's good that it's not a complete, quote, complete protein like that because you don't want more of those amino acids. We tend to get enough of them in just the, you know, the standard person gets plenty of that. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're balancing everything. And, and it's actually really great to get a lot more of the, the uh, amino acids from these connective tissues and the gelatin and that sort of thing that you're typically not getting in the standard diet. Uh, people, humans used to get a lot of it when uh, we used to either farm or, or et cetera, but use the entire or hunt and use the entire animal for, um, you know, some sort of food source, even down to the point of just like boiling the, the carcass and making a soup out of it, um, consuming the organs, that sort of thing. But people don't do that anymore. Yeah, or it's extremely rare. Hopefully, like we're kind of helping a resurgence back into that territory. But it's it's also just not easy to do. I mean, to find a uh, an entire cow, you know, you you can uh, uh, you can basically like find a farmer and and buy a cow from the farmer and get the meat delivered to you and everything. Uh, so that could be one way that you can get also get the bones and the organs and that sort of thing. But other than that, it's you can't walk into Whole Foods and be like, I want, you know, I want the 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 entire carcass of this cow because they don't even have it you know it's yeah it's it's not something that they even get delivered to them mm -hmm. and it's becoming a lot more accessible nowadays with things like butcher box and uh, u.s wellness meats or primal pastures like a lot of these will actually deliver like the uh the gelatinous joints and stuff like that to you so you can make your own bone broth and stuff like that too yeah um, which is really high in gelatin but usually uh the rule that I go by whenever it comes to, you know, putting in gelatin or bone broth or collagen into the mix is just not getting more than around a third of your protein to that, especially if like you're doing uh, resistance training and stuff like that, because, um, you know, the tryptophan, methionine and cysteine are necessary for tissue regeneration of the muscle. But beyond that, they really have no role. Um, and so yeah, getting get them from the muscle meats. Yeah. So getting um, you know, around a third of your protein intake from the collagen and gelatin and bone broth and stuff like that is usually ideal. Um, it's hard to get more than that for most people, unless yeah. you're just sitting like eat gelatin or whatever you're going to. Right. It's yeah. Kind of gross. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> adding it to other things is nice though. Yeah. yeah. It is really good. Especially the Umzu total bone broth. That stuff is amazing. Yeah. I put that on everything. Yeah. I do too. Yeah, it's like Frank's Red Hot. <laughs> yeah. Powder form. Mm -hmm. But um, It's really good with eggs. Yeah. Uh, another one is that usually um, up until the age of 25, like you do want to get a high amount of complete proteins because you're still building a lot of tissue and stuff like that, um, at least for a male because that's usually whenever they stop growing. And then beyond that, like um, besides for – muscular regeneration and stuff like that. It's not really, I don't, there's not really a uh, place for those amino acids. Mm -hmm. So, well, to, you want the balance. That's kind of the, the sum of this whole conversation on it. You want the balance of all the amino acids. The thing is that most people that eat just like breast meat or something like that all the time, mm -hmm. they're getting way over skewed balance of, of cysteine, methionine and tryptophan um, from like chicken breasts 
but they're not getting any sort of glycine, they're not getting any sort of proline, taurine, nothing like that. Um, that's why it, it helps to have, yeah, like a whole scope of different consumptions that you go to that where you can get that stuff, you can get the muscle tissue that you want. And uh, then you have a nice balanced amino acid profile hmm. in your diet. What about plant proteins? They're, yeah, this is an interesting one. You can get, you can basically get a lot of these amino acids from plants, mm -hmm. especially if you, uh, if, if you're like, you know, certain supplements, a lot of supplements with, with the right equipment, you can extract really anything that you want from a plant that is in that plant, you know, any sort of compound. Um, I don't th like, I, I remember reading a study where it, it compared plant proteins versus animal proteins in the context of muscle building for, I think it was just, you know, 20 to 35 year old males. Hmm. And uh, the the animal protein was superior in, in that context of building lean tissue. Um, plants are probably, you know, you want to take the same approach to picking a plant protein because uh, you can still get the certain amino acids from the, the protein. You want to look into uh, what's the amino acid profile of that specific plant that, and especially the, the protein source that you're going to be getting from it. And then you also need to be looking at the ride alongs. What else is involved with that? Um, you know, how was it farmed? It, it's a similar, that, that's why I like with Thermo, it's, it's kind of a framework of thinking uh, to, to make the best choices for mm -hmm. your diet. Stuff that's going to bring you toward hormonal balance and good uh, nutrient profile in your diet. Uh, but yeah, plants are no different. You, you should really look at, at, they're no different in the way that you select them, which actually ends up uh, putting a lot of them out of the picture. Mm -hmm. If you take that sort of like rigor to how you're gonna choose it, mm. most of them aren't really preferable. Yeah, um, especially like soy protein's a really big one. And some of the carry alongs for that are like diadzine, um, and the other, yeah, genistine, the other yeah. isoflavones that act as estrogen in the body. Yeah, goitrogens and estrogens, mm -hmm. phytoestrogens. Yeah. Um, the best plant protein, in my opinion at least, is potato protein, um, mainly because they have what are known as these keto acids. And so uh, these keto acids, well, I'll, t I'll go back a little bit. So, um, Protein is, in research, it's based on the digestibility of four amino acids, tryptophan, methionine, plus cysteine, threonine, and um, there's another one. I can't remember exactly what it is, but, uh, oh, it's lysine. And, uh, you know, the egg yolk is like the standard for protein, which has 100% availability of these, uh, you know, amino acids. And so... Um, potatoes have these keto acids in them that can actually be converted into amino acids, um, which gives the potato 110% digestibility of proteins. Um, so it's actually a more than perfect protein in some cases, if you're Damn, in need I of knew that. I love potatoes. Yeah, I know. Um, there's actually Is studies. there anything wrong with potatoes? <laughs> no. um, there's actually some studies that were done on... Um, there were a couple case studies that were done on male and females and they had like all the way up to 80% of their diet come from potatoes and they had no negative nitrogen balance. Mm -hmm. So there was no muscle loss or anything like that, which is really interesting. Cool. Yeah. So we need to make a umzu potato protein. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think like For vegan thermo people. Yeah. So if you are plant based, um, until we come out with that potato protein, usually around, five pounds a day of potatoes is usually enough to get uh your daily protein intake so you'll be really full too if you eat that many potatoes. <laughs> yeah yeah it yeah. takes um, gonna have long bathroom trips too yeah you're gonna want to like thoroughly cook those things <laughs> yeah roast them up or boil them yeah. yeah so uh how much protein do people usually need uh my my rule of thumb is like the average person eats too much protein or the average fitness oriented person eats too much protein. Other people tend to eat too little protein, which actually we saw when we were talking to Brenton on the other podcast, like he barely ate any protein before starting Thermo. So um, getting up into the range of especially like, and this is in trained guys, 
I typically recommend somewhere between 130 and 160 grams, mm -hmm. unless you're just like huge, um, you know, like a massive seven, seven foot tall, you know, giant dude. Mm -hmm. But if you're like a normal, you know, guy, like somewhere between 160 pounds, 200 pounds, then that's typically the range that it falls within. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, there's some studies that even show if you do, uh, like all the way down to 0.65, uh, pound, like multiply 0.65 times your body weight in pounds. Um, and that's usually like the lowest you want to go. Yeah. 0.8 is like the standard, I think mm -hmm. 0.8 to one, but one is even a bit high, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. So, yeah. But a lot of people, like if you look at a lot of bodybuilding, um, recommendations are all in like two yeah okay, it's way too high the the problem is like for the context is uh and there's a lot of research to back this up in terms of hormones you by going too high in protein you're skimping on other um the, the you know fats and carbs which are actually more important for your endocrine system to to be balanced so you need like a base level of protein that's going to support your activity and your recovery and then beyond that put all the rest of your consumption for the day into fats and carbs mm. and the other caveat is like like most people who are paying attention to this type of stuff are actually paying attention to the caloric intake as well so you are going say if you go up to you know 200 or 220 250 grams of protein a day it leaves very little in your caloric um you know uh, allocation to the fats and carbs and then uh it's also like typically not sustainable. And then the other thing is that people typically go, when they do that, they go to sources like chicken breasts, something like that, where you're now you're over consuming things like tryptophan um, on a daily basis. And then you're skewing the amino acid profile in general. So there's there's like a couple little nuances to, to why that typically ends up being bad for hormones. Um, and then the other the other caveat is if you are on like a calorically unrestricted diet and you're still going really high like that, uh, now you're just over consuming calories in general. Uh, and unless you have a really high metabolism, it's not going to you're going to be in an energy surplus. and Therefore, you're going to gain fat. So um, you want to make sure that you stay at, at the minimum level of pr protein that you need per day to support what you're doing and then put everything else into the right carbohydrates and the right fats, which we're also going to talk about in this episode. Heck yeah. Um, yeah, that's really all I can think about whenever it comes to protein. You got anything else? Uh, oh, the, the excessive ammonia production from too much is also really bad for the kidneys too. Like you can take a toll on the kidneys over time. Um, which whenever you turn, you know, 65, 70, you can get like renal failure and things like that. So that's something else to watch out for. Yep. You don't mm -hmm. want that. Yeah. So again, so wrap it up with protein. That's kind of the, the summation of it. Yeah. You need a good amino acid profile. So you need to pay attention to the sources that, of the protein that you're consuming and, and try not to have any of these ride along things like hormones, antibiotics, um, goitrogens, if you're, if you're eating plant-based proteins or phytoestrogens. And then, um, Beyond that, just like in terms of raw volume, keep it at, a, at the minimum amount that you actually need to support what you're doing and recovering, you know, getting stronger if you're lifting in the gym or whatever. Uh, but then beyond that, just consume carbs and fats, hmm. which now let's talk about carbs. Hmm. The ultimate macronutrient. Yeah, the best macronutrient. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it like probably doesn't even have to be said, but like just you know, the keto carbs is the carbs have become this taboo now mm -hmm. with the whole keto craze. But I said it a couple of years ago and I think it's how like, I can see it happening right now is that keto fat is dying, mm -hmm. it's starting to die off. Uh, now the pendulum is going to swing back to carbs mm -hmm. and people are probably going to go, I have a theory about these sort of trends, like in the human psyche and they, they tend to swing the pendulum equal with equal force to the opposite direction. That that's how, these sorts of things work. It's like a universal law almost. So what you're going to find is like keto got pretty extreme, to, to, you know, in recent years. And it's so extreme that people do think carbs are evil. They think sugar is evil. And when you start labeling things like it's evil, like what the hell, you know, it becomes this like a religious movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's going to swing to the opposite end of the spectrum. And then it's going to normalize back into a more moderate place. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but people are going to be defiant about it. And they're going to be like, yeah, I can, I can eat sugar all day long, like from, you know, shitty sources and that sort of thing. And still lose weight, which, which, you know, you see that already kind of happening sometimes. Like some people are doing that sort of thing. Um, but w the more moderate approach is kind of what we're going to be talking about here in terms of sources again, matter. It's, it's no different than protein in terms of like the way that you think about it in terms of a framework. And, uh, if you are consuming the right sources that your body really is designed to be consuming, then, uh, you're going to feel way better. You know, we're not advocating like going and eating candy. And another thing is, uh, well, you can eat some candy. Like there are literally candies that are thermo hmm. that some of these health foods, health food companies are coming out with, which is kind of fun because you know, like you feel like a little kid, you're eating these little Swedish fish or whatever. They're made out of, uh, you know, apple, apple pectin or, or like some sort of binding fiber. And then, then uh, some sugar, like raw cane sugar or something like that. And they're very simple and they're flavored with fruit juices. Um, something like that, but obviously you don't want to like eat so much of that sort of thing. And that, that's kind of what we're going to get to is, is how do you take a, a real thermal approach to, to this sort of thing? You're not going to want to eat, you know, 2000 calories of, of gummy bears every day. Yeah. I think, um, the way that the pendulum is, is swinging right now is with the, uh, plant-based approach. So we're going to see probably a large demonization of fat and protein in general and uh, a higher affinity for carbohydrates, plant-based specifically. Um, yeah, there is a big plant-based movement. Mm -hmm. I think it's, what's that movie? Is it Game Changer with Arnold Schwarzenegger that came out? Oh yeah, I haven't watched that yet. I haven't either, yeah. but I need to get into it. I honestly, I personally think it's all propaganda to demasculinize men so we don't have any resistance in the large grand scheme of things, but. Um, it's, it's possible. It's uh it's all conspiracy. So I'll, I'll leave that one for a different conversation. You know what? I like conspiracies because a lot of them are true. <laughs> yeah. As if conspiracy is a bad word. Um, but yeah, so yeah, the plant-based thing definitely like, especially with thermo, we want to make sure that, that we're inclusive for the plant-based eaters. Hmm. Cause a lot of people do it for different reasons. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it for health, though, it's not necessarily the healthiest way to go. I think that's, you know, be blunt about that one. Um, but if you're doing it for some other sort of reason, then, you know, I, I respect that. And, and we're trying to accommodate vegans with the thermo diet by, you know, helping. And, and there are vegans who do thermo. So that, I mean, that was just cool. Hmm. Uh, in terms of carb sources, what do you think are the best carb sources for somebody to eat? Let's take the same approach of, of how we were talking about protein. Um, so whenever it comes to this, I think it's a spectrum of again, again, to the most easily digestible protein. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it goes to the hardest to digest, which is things like grains and stuff like that, which are not thermo and shouldn't be consumed generally, uh, at all. Um, I would say the best sources are probably like fruit and fruit juices, um, specifically like the citrus fruit, because they're really easy to digest, um, very high in micronutrients. Um, and very pro-thyroid and pro-metabolic. So they're going to allow for, um, first of all, uh, fructose specifically is insulin independent. So it doesn't need insulin uh, to be taken up by the cell. Um, so, and a lot of people have insulin uh, misunderstood. So insulin actually raises to lower the amount of free fatty acids in the blood to allow glucose to get into the cell. That's why the glucose in the blood lowers whenever insulin goes up. Um, so a yeah, lot of it's like this battle between fatty acid metabolism and glucose, right? The constantly. Randall cycle. Yeah. The Randall cycle. Yeah. But, um, so that's the biggest thing that I see is people just have a misunderstanding of the foundational things that actually make, uh, these things work. Yeah. So fruit, um, Tip, and there's a lot of fruit, there's savory fruits and there's, there's uh, sweet fruits. Mm -hmm. So, which a lot of people, there's a misunderstanding and this is probably a good place to do it, but um, the difference between vegetables and fruits, it's a, it's a language issue almost, or a, just a, like a cognitive issue mm -hmm. from, from an understanding, like a, of a societal understanding of what certain things are. But uh, I think I, I prefer breaking them out into more accurate definitions where fruits are, fruits can be sweet, they can be savory. Fruits are typically the 
you know, fruit of a flowering plant. Uh, and they're, they're going to fall. It's going to, you know, a tomato is as much a fruit as a apple. Um, also a, you know, an avocado is a fruit. Mm -hmm. Bell peppers, bell peppers are fruits, cucumbers, zucchinis. Um, yeah. So these sorts of things, snap peas are even fruits. Mm. Uh, these sorts of things are, are fruits. Whereas a lot of times people are going to define them as vegetables. So then they get mad when I say that vegetables aren't necessary, but vegetables <laughs> are typically in a real strict definition are leaves and stems, mm -hmm. which are not necessary for human survival or thriving at all. They're actually really hard to digest. They release a lot of um, like microtoxins that are defense mechanisms for the plant, which makes total logical sense. The plant's trying to protect itself. It's trying to protect its roots and its, uh, the fruits are actually the easy accessible part of the plant that, mm -hmm. that animals eat typically, uh, and the roots. Like you see a lot of uh, rodents who actually are digging up constantly digging up roots and eating them from plants. They're not trying to eat the, the leaves of the plant. Right. Uh, the, the plant's defense mechanisms are also against usually insects because insects are what's going to be eating the, the leaves. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, insecticidal and goitrogenic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, typically they're really high in goitrogens, which block iodine uptake in the thyroid, especially if you're eating a lot of leaves raw, which people do. Like most people eat leaves raw uh, in salads and so forth. They don't highly cook them. Therefore, I, I think it's just completely unnecessary waste of money and waste of health to eat that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you think of goitrogens, one good thing to think about is like goiter. So you can develop goiter from a lack of iodine in the diet, which is like that big bulge. Yeah, it's like um, the thyroid starts swelling up. Mm -hmm. And that's when you see, you can see it on livestock usually if they're fed something they're not supposed to be fed and they start to get this big swollen um, neck. It's a little more rare to see in people, but people definitely get goiter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only reason that I could see people using vegetables is first of all, um, well, the only reason really is for the calcium that's found within them. But in order to have that accessible, you have to degrade these these goitrogenic compounds and a lot of these other things by overcooking them for a long period of time, like like boil them for at least 20 to 45 minutes in order to thoroughly break down these goitrogens. And then you take the broth from that and it's high in calcium, which is something that a lot of plant based people lack. It, they don't have enough calcium in their diet because they eat raw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then like. We also don't have the ability to digest cellulose, which makes up the plant cell wall because mm -hmm. um, we lack the enzyme cellulase. So it just sits in our gut and ferments and leads to things like uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth um, and then more endotoxin, which creates more serotonin, which it's all connected. Just yeah. keeps going in a circle. So the moral of the story is that you don't need to eat vegetables. Also to, I mean, you can if you want, but we recommend really boiling them down or, or something to degrade everything in it, mm -hmm. which is then like, to, I'm just going to be straightforward here. Like, what's the point? It tastes bad. Um, how are you going to like, is there really any sort of like great benefit to sticking all that time into cooking and preparing something like that? Uh, not really. You can get whatever nutrient you need, like calcium from some other source. It's pretty easy. Like mineral water, for example, just drink mm -hmm. some mineral water. It's got a ton of calcium in it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> focus on fruits. Fruits are highly, they're easy to digest. They're literally like evolutionarily designed to be eaten and you can't digest the seeds inside of them. So feces, the seeds come out in the feces and typically the cycle of say it was like, a, you know, an apple tree, picture an apple tree in your mind. The, you know, some animal is going to come by, grab the apple, eat it, poop it out that the seed's gonna go back into the ground somehow, and then it's gonna grow another apple tree. Mm -hmm. And so with some a, good fertilizer too. Yeah, with some fertilizer, you know, it's a pretty genius system that nature has there. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't get eaten, the apples rot, they fall off, they fall on the ground, and then they have the opportunity to grow again. And, you know, you also have things like birds who can come and spread the seeds around and whatever. Um, so focus on fruits. They also just taste a million times better uh, they're easy to digest. They also contain a lot of prebiotic fibers, which your gut needs in order to support a healthy bacteria, um, a healthy bacterial milieu in the gut. Uh, and then roots, 
So easy way to think about it and remember is fruits and roots. And a lot of people also call roots vegetables, but I think that's just a misnomer. Uh, they're, they're technically tubers. Uh, so you have things like potatoes, which we've talked about. You have sweet potatoes, um, even, you know, carrots are roots, um, onions, hmm. that sort of stuff. Uh, those are going to be a preferable source of typically starch that you can consume and they taste great. Also, they're extremely nutrient dense. Uh, I've seen campaigns against against potatoes too, where they're like, there's no nutrients in them. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. It's, it's literally, like, that makes no sense <laughs> whatsoever. A potato is literally like the part that is designed to um, give life to another plant. Yeah. Like it, it has all the nutrients necessary for life. It'll grow independent of even being watered. Like if you stick a potato on a table and just leave it there, it so starts to grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll grow a plant out of it. Um, they're extremely dense in nutrients. They have good protein source. And, um, and there's a lot of electrolytes typically in tubers mm -hmm. that people need because everyone's really deficient in, in these electrolytes. Yeah, people don't realize that potatoes are probably one of the best sources of vitamin C, potassium. Um, they're decent in magnesium. One thing that I will say though is like whenever you're picking your fruits, um, make sure that they are thoroughly ripened because if not, then some people can experience some like digestive distress and inflammation and just some irritability in general. And then whenever it comes to things like rice or potatoes, just make sure that you thoroughly cook them mm -hmm. very, very well. Yeah, and then in terms of other starch that you could eat, you know, that's thermo, is go for like pure starches, like white rice. Uh, there's also with rice as a spectrum of just based on farming practices mostly, uh, like contamination with heavy metals. That's why, that's one of the reasons why we don't recommend brown rice. Uh, it's easily contaminated just in growing practices and typically the contaminants stay in the hull. So any pesticides, heavy metals, herbicides are in the hull, which is the brown part around the rice grain. Uh, not only that, they're also just full of um, anti-nutrients. So the anti-nutrients are gonna bind uh, certain minerals in your body and make them inert, like unusable for the body. So then you end up uh, leaching these, the minerals that you really need and that everyone's typically highly deficient in. Mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna be leaching these out of your body just by consuming this brown rice. There's big brown rice fat, obviously, you know, a couple decades ago and it's still lingering. People still think like, they still are like, what, I shouldn't eat brown rice? When, when I tell someone that they're mm -hmm. like, wait, I thought brown rice was healthy. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of just dumb propaganda that gets spread around um, for certain industries and people think it's like a medical mandate, uh, but it's not true at all. White rice is far healthier and then typically the ones, the sources of white rice with, with the least amount of any sort of contaminant, like next to zero is jasmine and basmati rice. Hmm. Uh, especially if you get it organic, that means, you know, the, the growing practice was a lot better than if it was like a typically grown one. So those are what I recommend in terms of like another source of starch. And it gets, it gets kind of fun because you can find, you know, good rice noodles. Uh, you can find sweet potato noodles. Uh, you, basically with Thermo, you can literally like recreate any sort of recipe you ever wanted mm -hmm. uh, that you like. And you can recreate it with Thermo options. And it ends up typically tasting better mm -hmm. because the, the source of that starch or, or whatever is, you know, a lot of times sweeter. And, it, you know, it's just... Um, kind of more fulfilling and richer in terms of sat more satisfying. Yeah. So there's a couple things that we can talk about right there is just like, so one of the anti-nutrients that are found that binds to all of that things is called phytic acid. And so basically it just has a negative charge and it attracts all the positive ions, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's then like, it's like magnetism or it's mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's all biochemistry. Yeah. Um, and then make sure that the sources of rice or any type of, um, you know, uh, pre-made uh, starch, if you will, is not iron enriched. You don't wanna have too much iron. You can become very iron toxic and then it can uh, deposit it in places which is not ideal because you can have, you know, like pituitary deposition of iron, uh, which can lead to different kind of hormonal secretions. I see a lot of prolactin specifically that is increased in higher amounts um, due to iron deposition. And then um, if you are taking in polyunsaturated fatty acids 
and those get into contact with iron, they can actually create the aging pigment, which is known as lipofuscin. Um, and interestingly enough, this can actually be oxidized with sunlight. And so um, we see higher rates of skin cancer and stuff like that um, simply by increasing iron intake and having polyunsaturated fat intake too. Yeah, there was a study that, that so uh, excess iron also affects your gut negatively too. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a study in Norway where they, they basically took, their, because the WHO had this big mandate that you have to enrich iron in like on a governmental level mm. in flowers in countries, um, a lot of countries did it and the U.S. still does it. And uh, in Norway, they noticed that when they did it, there was a large uptick in what people would call, you know, celiac disease or gluten intolerance, where there was a lot of um, reported uh, gut issues when they were con consuming the flour. And which is interesting because like a lot of people say like that, that, I that whole idea of gluten intolerance kind of came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's a possibility it could be linked to this sort of thing because when they, they uh, got rid of the iron mandate in Norway, just went back to normal flowers, uh, the, the incidences of gut issues went down massively. So it wasn't typically, it wasn't necessarily like a, a celiac thing. It was just too much iron in the diet mm -hmm. and they, it was messing up their gut. Mm -hmm. And they went back to like kind of normal levels of gut health hmm. reported. Obviously that all this is like reported through doctor's offices and that sort of thing. Hmm. Um, but that's just an interesting tidbit where it did seem like no one had these gut issues until recently mm -hmm. when, when consuming flour. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, another thing is that like certain organs in the body, specifically the brain and the thyroid can only use glucose as a fuel source. Uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, try to say that ketones are the preferred fuel source, but that's actually just a secondary mechanism that is, um, it's for survival, right? It's for absence of glucose. Mm -hmm. It's just, it basically, um, ketones are a signaling molecule to the body that basically tells your body that it's in a starvation state. And this starvation state basically raises all the stress hormones in the body. So you're more aware, um, and you're more, um, in tune with your environment, not necessarily focused on yourself. So your body is focusing its energy on trying to get to a better fuel source. It's not necessarily focusing on um, very energetic and energetically demanding things like reproduction, digestion, um, abstract thinking, stuff like that. Hair. Hair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of yeah, these keto it, people are bald. <laughs> yeah. They start losing hair, thinning. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and plus like when you get deep into it, like a keto or ketosis, whatever, um, you see a lot of, or you hear a lot of reports of people just losing their reproductive function in general, like their libido goes away. Uh, they have trouble in the bedroom in general. They have no desire, it's just gone. Um, that's an interesting, uh, I guess, correlate to what you're just saying. Like it, your body just literally stops focusing on thriving and it starts focusing on surviving and, um, that adrenaline increase is known as a catecholamine honeymoon. And that's what a lot of people, when they switch to keto diet, the, the most common people, like group of people that I've seen that, that do the keto diet are people that typically have done like a, a standard diet where they're not really paying attention a whole lot, including calorie intake, and they end up getting themselves into some trouble uh, over decades in terms of their health. Then they, they hear about keto and they see, um, you know, tr transformations of people going from obesity down to just simply being overweight. Mm -hmm. And um, that ends up being that typical first step for, for the vast majority of people that are in on this keto craze right now. Uh, so they, it's like a false positive essentially where <clears throat> they feel better, typically also because they're eating better foods. Like they're actually focused on the food and they're saying like, oh, well, I'm gonna eat a steak instead of going to McDonald's and getting like two double cheeseburgers, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just a better food source in general. And then uh, they start to first drop a lot of body weight or bo uh, body like water weight. And um, the also they drop, they do lose weight based on the fact that, that uh, the, they're consuming fewer calories for the most part. 
un- unless you kind of hear sometimes about people who are like, oh, I eat 8,000 calories a day on keto and I still lose weight. It's like, <laughs> you probably don't. Because yeah. if you're really doing doing that, then, you know, 8,000 calories of 80% fat, like how the hell are you going to do that? Yeah. It's disgusting. Um, so there's that. And then they have the catecholamine honeymoon at the same time where they go from being like complete brain fog for and no motivation. And they're just like, a lack of clarity in general in the mind, which is indicative of just a poor diet in general, and then go toward uh, an increase in the catecholamines, which is going to make them more alert to their surroundings. And they're going to be like, wow, I haven't felt this clear and focused in a long time. Uh, The thing is that it's called a honeymoon for a reason, because it doesn't last. Uh, Typically, it's going to last for a period of a month or so, maybe a little longer. And uh, then what happens is, is they start to because of the catabolic nature of, of those those uh, catecholamine, catecholamines, they're called catecholamines for a reason. Cata- there's a catabolic effect of them over a chronic, like chronically long period of time when they're elevated in the, in the blood. And um, they start to break down muscle tissue. They start to really break down any tissue uh, because they're not anabolic at all. Mm-hmm. Um, anabolic means grow, it means like growth oriented. Um, so you have really low levels of anabolic hormones, especially because the, the sex drive and the, the reproductive system gets, gets uh, really damaged by the high catecholamine levels. And so you don't even have the ability to produce a lot of uh, um, anabolic hormones anymore. Uh, it's, it kind of shuts that system down. So now you have chronically elevated uh, catecholamines. And eventually people just seem to hit a wall. Their, their weight loss stalls. Um, they start to get brain fog again. Uh, they start to just feel bad in general, like very low energy and that sort of thing. Uh, and then they start to have physical symptoms, like we're saying, like hair thinning and, and, um, you know, typically they don't, they just, they don't even look like their physique doesn't even improve. It just looks like a slightly smaller version of its former self. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they're still holding fat in all the same places. And, um, it's typically not a, a good scenario. So we've seen a lot of people that uh, are in the thermo diet community come from keto and notice massively, uh, like just very big improvements rather immediately. And I hope we can get some of them on the podcast here because it, it's uh, they have interesting stories about like how they used to think versus how they're thinking now and how rapid the improvement is. It usually takes a week or two and then they're just feeling like totally better uh, because Another thing with keto is you end up being extremely nutrient deficient when you're not consuming things like fruits and you're not consuming uh, easily digested, uh, nutri- like high nutrient dense carb sources, like the fruits and roots. Mm-hmm. Um, you start to become deficient because you're and and a lot of people again it comes down to like maybe a lack of awareness around protein choices, but they focus on a lot of proteins that are skewing things in the wrong direction in terms of amino acid profiles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, during that catecholamine cocktail, whenever you're in it for a long amount of time, you usually experience what is known as um, adrenal fatigue, if you will. Simply, the adrenal glands um, are just overworked because they're constantly pumping out those catecholamines. um, And they don't have any way to basically shut down because there's no alleviation of um, that stressed metabolism, you know. And then... um, whenever it comes to ketosis specifically. And like, this is another thing, whenever the body has mechanisms uh, to produce something in a way, whenever it lacks something else, that kind of says that it's necessary. And so um, whenever you have too much, whenever you have a certain amount of protein um, and a lack of carbohydrates, your body produces uh, glucose via gluconeogenesis from amino acids. And so, you know, a lot of people uh, that are trying to get into ketosis constantly stay out of ketosis because there's bo- their body's producing glucose through the increased protein intake. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah, that was a funny study. Uh, it made me laugh when I saw it. It came out, I think, last year, the year before. Of You know, everyone talks about BHB. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, you know, these exogenous ketones that you can take that they're being marketed as as a like a form of, how do you how do you get into ketosis super fast you know um they it was funny because there was a study head to head with like a sugar drink 
and um, they had the same effect on the body. Like they had similar spikes and it, it was just, really? it was funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, literally this is no different than drinking a Gatorade. Yet people think that they're they're like slipping into ketosis and they're like hacking their body and all. I'm like, geez. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, and then like a lot of people experience insulin resistance whenever they go uh, oh, yeah, higher fat, lower carb too. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that. Yeah, because your body literally forgets how to process glucose properly. So then people end up getting stuck in a cycle where they're feeling this like catecholamine high and then they binge inevitably, like everyone does. Mm -hmm. if, if you go to one extreme, you're going to binge to the other side. It's just a matter of time um, because also there's an important psychology with something like a keto diet where uh, it's a restriction psychology. So if you feel like you're restricting yourself and you feel like you're, you have this low energy and you start to feel like shit, eventually people are going to go back toward the other end uh whether they like it or not they're gonna and they're gonna feel shame about it and they're gonna feel bad about it but they're gonna go binge on a bunch of carbohydrates and they're not gonna be fruits and roots mm -hmm. it's gonna be you know donuts uh which is also which is way worse even like now you have an enriched flour that's also that's fried in uh polyunsaturated fat mm -hmm. so now you're introducing like the double whammy back into the system the body doesn't remember how to process those carbohydrates in general mm -hmm. and now that person's going to feel sick and so they're going to blame it on the carbs even when they're they like again they're not eating like a sweet potato or something they're, yeah high they're, quality yeah they're eating and they would still probably feel a bit strange after eating something like a sweet potato but because their their body's just kind of uh, like off they'd probably get that tingly blood sugar issue mm -hmm. um the but then they go and they'll eat like some junk food sources most people revert back to the diet that they're eating before they started the keto diet which again from in most cases was not good and um then they feel bad they blame it on carbs or sugar um as a singular source but what they don't realize is that they did that to their body by being in ketosis and then they also are not they're they're like over simplifying this whole thing in terms of of the the moniker that they're putting on it it's not sugar it's not carbs it's the fact that you ate a low quality food source uh that was also fried in polyunsaturated fats too mm -hmm. so then they feel sick and then they blame carbs now they keep reinforcing the fact that they think carbs are evil and then they go right back to keto you know get quote back on the wagon on mm -hmm. monday after a, a weekend binge right that's that's how it works. I mean, I've seen it a million times. It, it's just a basic form of like dieting psychology, and uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of there's so much misinformation around all this stuff that people don't really realize what they're doing to their body when they do something like this. Mm -hmm. And going back to like the cellular level, um, so the the free fatty acids in the blood are extremely elevated in a ketotic state, and so uh, because there's so many free fatty acids in the blood. Uh, insulin doesn't actually have the ability to lower them to an effective amount to allow glucose to get into the cell. Um, and whenever we look at it at a mitochondrial level, so the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, if you will, so it produces CO2, water, and ATP. Um, basically, glucose produces around 36 to 38 ATP per molecule burned. Ketones only produce about 22 ATP molecules, and ATP is basically the energy currency of the cell that allows for all um, cellular processes to take place. So it lowers flow of energy. Mm -hmm. So that's another another thing to think about. Yeah, well, and that's that's a big like overarching principle of the thermo diet is that you want to eat in a way that increases the flow of energy through the system, which mm -hmm. is the body. Um, and there's all these tiny systems, like you have the cell is a system, uh, you have a, an organ, which is a system, you have tissues, you have whatever else, the whole organism is a, is a system. So you wanna essentially make decisions that are gonna allow for the, the a higher flow of energy through that system because that creates a higher amount of order within the system, which then in, in the context of the body as a system creates more health because everything's functioning properly. So even something like that, a basic fact there um, that it's your cells in a fatty acid metabolism start producing less um, or they're not it, it's almost it's like transducing not necessarily producing mm -hmm. but um, there's a, there's a lower out 
uh, output of ATP in a free in a fatty acid metabolism than there is in a glucose metabolism, uh, which indicates a low. It's almost half, right? So, mm -hmm. indicates a just a lowering of the flow of energy through the system, mm -hmm. which creates more disorder in the system. And it kind of clouds that system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes it less efficient, less effective. Uh, so, okay, so that's carbohydrates. I think we've touched on everything. Also, sourdough, hallelujah, is thermo. Yeah. Um, Properly fermented, high quality sourdough, of course. Yeah. Good flour. So, get you know, organic sourdough, ferment it over you know, a good period of time so it's actually fully fermented. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's become one of the most popular things in, in the thermo community is the ability to use sourdough because you can use it uh, f you know, for making burgers, sandwiches, whatever. Um, and sourdough actually tastes way better than all of their bread sources, in my opinion. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know. Every time I get a loaf of sourdough, I feel like a Viking just taking a big old bite out of that, br that loaf of bread. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so fats, let's yep. talk about fats. Yeah. Fats you want to, obviously you probably picked up on it by now. We're not huge fans of polyunsaturated fats. Uh, polyunsaturated fats are typically, you're going to get them in sources like the the most readily available sources are seed oils veg, like what people call vegetable oils um that are used in like every restaurant and an obscene amount of food uh like packaged foods it, it's frustrating actually mm -hmm. when i see it, something i'm like oh that looks like it might be thermo and i pick it up and i read the label and it's like no organic potato like you say it's potato chips it's like organic potatoes sea salt um, paprika, chili powder, sunflower oil. Oh it's like, fuck. <laughs> Use some good oil, right? Yeah, I know. And then you got to spend 30 minutes trying to find a good, <laughs> a good potato chip. Yeah. You know what frustrates me too? So I, uh, I've been watching that chef show. I like that show on Netflix. Which Have one? you watched it? It's just uh, called the chef show. Mm, I haven't. Yeah. It's no. John Favreau and Roy Choi. And, and then they have like all these famous people on it or they have like famous chefs on it and stuff and a lot of the time all these french chefs they're like french classically trained chefs like incredible chefs they they put together these recipes and they're all it's like completely thermo and then they're like well let's cook it and then they just take a big plastic jug of vegetable oil Ugh. out and spray it all over the i'm like you just ruined all that food you get all this <laughs> awesome food and then you just like fry it in a bunch of vegetable oil. are you kidding uh. me so there's just this massive lack of awareness around the, the, not even just the harm around it, but even with the French chef. That's what frust frustrates me the most. Like French trained chef, uh, chef is going to typically care so much about the quality of their food and the taste and the flavors and everything. And then you see them like frying all this beautiful food in some shit oil that's going to like ruin the whole dish, mm -hmm. including the taste. Yeah. It just blows my mind. It's like use butter. And luckily, a lot of French people are obsessed with butter, so they, they do use a lot of good butter. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the times when they're doing some sort of saute or something like that, it's like vegetable oil. It's like, come on. Yeah. So Maybe whenever awareness. It, it comes down to like just the basic molecular level, like these polyunsaturated fats, um, they have, first of all, they're unsaturated because they don't have as many hydrogen bonds attached to the carbon bonds on the molecule. And they have these double bonds that are very rigid and uh, very easy to break, which allows for oxidation. And that oxidation process uh, creates free radicals and then it has down-regulating effects that um, lead to inflammation a whole bunch, and like prostaglandin synthesis and a whole bunch of other things in the system versus something like a highly saturated fat, which is completely saturated in hydrogen molecules and they have single bonds so they're very flexible um and they're very uh you know stable yeah. in heat Resilient. and light and things yeah. like that yeah well an easy way to think about the difference between an unsaturated and a saturated uh, fatty acid is the just visually like saturated is going to be solid mm -hmm. at room temperature so if it's sitting on a shelf or whatever solid think about butter or coconut oil and then an unsaturated fat is going to be liquid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they can't, it, 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 uh, it's, you know, it becomes liquid before room temperature. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to like, can you even freeze it? Like what, what's the, what happens if you freeze an unsaturated fat? It should turn solid, right? I don't, an unsaturated fat? Maybe not. I don't know if they, maybe not. I don't know if they freeze. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh -uh. But, um, 
What's interesting is, is that you can uh, actually get, and they've actually done studies on mice with peanut oil. And they, what they've done is they, they'll go through, uh, they'll fully hydrogenate this. So there's a difference between partial hydrogenation, which is like hydrogenated vegetable oil, which has trans fats and all those other things. And then you have fully hydrogenated oil, which allows for the chemical process to go to full hydrogenation, which means um, they're, yeah, they're just atta- they're completely saturating this molecule with hydrogen ions and it allows the fat to become completely saturated. And they did a uh, study on mice with peanut oil in Russia, and they actually found that it actually increased the activity of the mitochondria because it was a 100% completely saturated fat. Um, Obviously, I'm sure it was completely isolated too, so it didn't have any of the anti-nutrients that are associated with that. But I use a uh, fully hydrogenated coconut oil, and this thing, it kind of sucks because um, the the melting point goes from like a regular 76 degrees with coconut oil to 92 degrees. And the bottle that it comes in is super hard to get it out. So I'll be sitting in the kitchen for like 10 minutes trying to squeeze the coconut oil out of this stupid bottle and it won't come out. Um, and so, yeah, that's the challenge of having a really good saturated fat, I guess. Yeah, well, for the most part, um saturated fat sources that you're going to find are going to come down to animal animal fat sources. Mm-hmm. Uh, so again, all the same rules apply in terms of quality. And you want like a, you want good butter, not some butter that was made in a, from a cow that was artificially uh, in, um, what do you call it when it's lactating, mm-hmm. um, which they do with estrogen treatments. They keep them lactating for long, long periods of time because it just you know, commercially, financially, like makes more milk, mm-hmm. makes more cream. Um, the so you want to get like just a uh, responsibly raised animal source mm-hmm. for that fat. And uh, another benefit of it is it tastes way better. To to say you're gonna cook something in butter versus you know peanut oil, it's mm-hmm. gonna taste a lot better. Uh, the, another source of fat though, there's which I I recommend using less often than. Um, than saturated fat is monounsaturated fats. And they're typically uh, gonna come from fruit. So um, the, the main sources being olives and avocados. Mm-hmm. And the cool thing about avocados, the avocado oil is that it's um, got a really high smoke point. So it takes a lot of heat for it to degrade. Uh, so it actually ends up being a, a good cooking oil option. It's got a good flavor to it too. Uh, whereas olive oil, uh, you could cook with it, but keep it on low heat or, or don't cook with it and use it for things like a salad dressing or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there was another one that I heard you talk about. I think it started with an A. It was a monounsaturated fat. Um, I think it was, it was on the 30 man foods, the man foods argan list. Oil? Argan oil. Yeah. yeah. That's another good one. Yeah. Argan oil is way more common over in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that's another monounsaturated fat source that there was research talking about it increasing testosterone levels. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, but I'd, I'd recommend in terms of fat sources, sticking mostly with saturated fats from good animal sources. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of like macronutrient ratios, what are your best recommendations for those? Like just to like a general range for each. Um, this one's always interesting cause it's, my views have evolved over the years on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it also really depends on, they've evolved because I noticed it depends on the person. Mm-hmm. Uh, on like kind of a starting point and then a progression within that individual about where they're gonna end up. So uh, say somebody is coming like from a keto diet, uh, they might not handle a higher carbohydrate load very well mm-hmm. right away. Mm-hmm. Eventually they will, they'll be fine. but. Uh, that's one of the most common things from people that I that I hear about, like coming off the keto diet. Again, for reasons we've already discussed, like their body's not great at handling the carbohydrates right away. Um, so, having a shifting a, a bit of a lower ratio of the carbohydrates and then a, increasing it over time is probably going to make them feel best. And I think a lot of it comes down to like that individual monitoring their body and monitoring how they're feeling, monitoring how they're thinking, and the clarity there and um, their digestion and so forth. So it is a progression. 
<clears throat> a lot of people, especially with who are leaner, who have, um, you know, a good amount of lean muscle tissue can handle a high load of carbohydrates, especially if they're, um, you know, in some sort of training, resistance training, especially, um, they're going to, you know, you're going to be able to eat like a massive amount of carbohydrates without gaining fat. It's going to be increasing your metabolic rate in the meantime. So therefore you can, uh, with, with the higher metabolic rate getting pushed up over time, you can actually eat more food and still stay very lean. Um, as long as the food sources are like these thermo sources, you can, you can consume higher amounts of calories over time and, and keep the same level of leanness or actually drop body fat, hmm. which is kind of fun and it's cool, especially when it comes down to like, you know, eating more carbs is always fun. Yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. And then I, I would recommend like maybe a good place for people to start is to find what that, maybe it's the 0.8 grams per pound, um, start with a protein hmm. calibration and then uh, start there and then mess around with your carbs and fats mm -hmm. until you start feeling really good. And then, then you're on this progression forward and you start to, you can readjust and increase the amount of carbohydrates that you consume over time. Mm. Yeah. Usually as a recommendation for protein for women as a minimum, it's usually around 80 grams. And then usually as a minimum for males, it's like 120, mm -hmm. like you said. Um, and then I usually see people start off with around you know, 40% carbohydrates, um, and then like a 30%, uh, to 35% fat. That's usually, uh, the best for, um, uh, less sensitive people, you know, for the carbohydrates. Usually, um, some people, especially if you're fresh off of keto, it'd be an even lower percentage, probably around like, you know, 35, somewhere around there mm -hmm. for the carbohydrates. Yeah. Stick with sources that are going to make it easy for you too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fruit specifically. Fruit can be very good whenever you're whenever you're trying to uh, get back to the insulin sensitive state. Yeah. Oh, and just on the topic of fructose, because I know there will be people that mention this. Um, there's a lot of like false demonization of fructose causing fatty liver disease, mm. and it doesn't. It's just a choline it's deficiency. A choline deficiency. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, population wide, 92% of people are estimated choline deficient. Mm -hmm. It's probably higher than that. Uh, it's probably one of those like hundred percent type things. Mm. And, uh, that lack of choline actually is what causes the, the fatty, um, fatty acid accumulation in the liver. Mm -hmm. So it's not the fructose, it's choline. Yeah. And there's a big difference between fructose and high fructose corn syrup. There's a huge difference there. Mm -hmm. We're not, we're not promoting, um, HFCS. So, yeah. Well, cause again, you want a nutrient balance. Like you gotta be able to consume the nutrients that your body needs. Uh, if you're focusing your carbohydrate consumption on, well, again, like a corn source isn't necessarily thermo mm -hmm. in the first place, but then if you're focusing your carb consumption on like always eating high amounts of, of sugar, that's not, uh, has, has no nutrients intact then you're also still going to become deficient in the nutrients. And it seems pretty simple to me, but like a lot of people just don't grasp that mm -hmm. nuance. They want it to be like dead, stupidly simple. Um, and I guess while we're on it, we're already talking about carb sources too, is uh, masa. Oh yeah. So masa is another one that's thermo. So it's made from corn, but it's the corn that's grown and prepared in the typical uh, traditional Mexican culture mm -hmm. and they use calcium hydroxide otherwise known as lime to break down all the anti-nutrients they've been doing this for thousands of years and you can still find it and it tastes awesome uh, especially like people like they'll make tortillas out of masa and they'll fry it in um, lard or butter mm -hmm. and it's like it's delicious it's delicious yeah yeah um, so up up for that type of thing and it's kind of like with sourdough and masa, I'd still recommend like not basing your primary intake of carbohydrates on that. Mm -hmm. um, also, because it is kind of harder, it's harder to find that sort of thing. Yeah, and especially you, good quality. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you want to um, just, you know, have easy to digest, very nutrient dense carb sources to make up the bulk of your carbohydrates, yeah. which end up being fruits and roots. Yeah, one last thing that I want to touch on on those is like, so um, the masa, 
whenever it goes through this alkalization process, it actually frees up a lot of the nutrients that are found within the corn. So it has a higher... It's um, the only way to get them out. Yeah. Yeah. So it has a higher niacinamide content in it. Mm -hmm. It has a higher calcium content in it, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then whenever it comes to the sourdough, um, it actually breaks down the gluten molecule, which allows those amino acids. So gluten is a protein. It breaks down that protein and allows those amino acids to be more bioavailable. So it's actually increasing the amount of protein that's found within that bread. So that's another protein bread. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why you also see all this enriched bread. Like they have to put all these other nutrients into it mm -hmm. because you can't get it out unless you go through a fermentation process or, or like a, a lye. Is it lime or lye? I think it's lime. I think, I don't know. I don't remember what the a street name. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> but the masa process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay, cool. You got anything else? I, th I think this is, you know, pretty detailed episode. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. So if you like this podcast, leave us a good review. Uh, wherever you're listening to it, iTunes, Stitcher, Play, Player FM, YouTube, wherever. Uh, Drop us a good line. If you don't like it, don't leave a review at all. And uh, if you want to hear more like it, then uh, just subscribe to the podcast. And we'll see you on the next, next uh, episode. Also, we have other episodes if you want to listen to those. Yeah. Go check out thermodiet.com to learn more about Thermo.